Our phone hadn't been used so incessantly so late at night since the death of my grandmother a couple of years back. It was close to 11 before my father had returned everyone's call, and another hour before my parents left the kitchen, where they'd been quietly conversing together and themselves went to bed. And it was another two hours after that before I could assure myself that they were sound asleep, and that in the bed beside mine my brother was no longer glaring at the ceiling, but was also asleep, and that I could safely get up without being discovered and make my way to the back door and undo the lock and slip out of the flat and pad down the stairs into the cellar and, in the dark, steer myself barefoot across the dank floor to our storage bin. There was nothing impulsive or hysterical driving me, nothing melodramatic about my decision, nothing reckless that I could see. People said afterward that they would had no idea that beneath the fourth grade patina of obedience and good manners I could be such a surprisingly irresponsible daydreaming child. But this was no shallow daydream. I wasn't playing at make-believe, and I wasn't making mischief for mischief's sake. As it turned out, the mischief-making with Earl Axman had been valuable training, but undertaken for a purpose entirely different. I surely didn't feel as though I were rushing headlong into insanity, not even when I stood in the dark bin removing my pajamas and stepping into Selden's pants, while at the same time mentally warding off the ghost of his father and trying not to be terrified by Alvin's empty wheelchair. I wasn't being swallowed up by anything other than the determination to resist the disaster our family and our friends could no longer elude and might not survive. Later, my parents said he didn't know what he was doing, and sleepwalking became the official explanation, but I was fully awake and my motivation never obscured to me. All that was obscure was whether I would succeed. One of my teachers suggested that I had been suffering from delusions of grandeur, inspired by what I was learning in school about the Underground Railroad, organized before the Civil War to assist slaves in making their way north to freedom. Not so. I wasn't at all like Sandy, in whom opportunity had quickened the desire to be a boy on the grand scale, riding the crest of history. I wanted nothing to do with history. I wanted to be a boy on the smallest scale possible. I wanted to be an orphan. There was only one thing I couldn't leave behind, my stamp album. Perhaps... If I could have been sure that it would be preserved undisturbed after I was gone, I wouldn't at the last moment on the way out of my bedroom have stopped to open my dresser drawer and as quickly as I could lifted it from where it was stored beneath my socks and my underclothes. But it was intolerable to think of my album ever being broken up or thrown out or worst of all, given away wholly intact to another boy. And so I took it under my arm and along with, the, with it, the musket-shaped letter opener I'd bought at Mount Vernon, whose beak of a bayonet I used to slice neatly open, the only mail ever addressed to me, other than birthday cards, the packets of approval sent regularly from Boston 17, Massachusetts, by the world's largest stamp firm, H.E. Harris & Co., and we'll pause there.